I, I have them, Joanna, and I will read them. Okay, sounds great. Thanks. You ready to go? The portions yes, for the agenda. Are you going to be able to read those? You know, the, the... I'll call this meeting of the May 26th, 2020 Christiansburg Town Council to order. Uh, as we always do, we will observe a moment of reflection. And I hope that we will keep the veterans and those that gave their lives in service of this country uh, as a kind of a continued day from Memorial Day yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, which I will lead. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Hearing none, we will move to the public comments section. We have uh, our public hearing section, I should say. We have the annual budget 2021 and lease agreement fiber technology solutions LLC for uh, renting the Cambria Street property, Northwest 415. There was no one that signed up to speak in either one of these uh, public hearings. Uh, Ms. Twitty, I'm gonna turn the budget over to you and let you brief us on where we are, you and Randy. Okay, thanks, Mayor. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I have a fairly short presentation. I'm gonna go over on where we are and um, all that. So give me a second to put this up. Okay, so just quickly, I thought I'd go over some of the things we've changed and kind of where we are with respect to the budget this year. So we first presented the first draft on 417, I believe. Um, and our excluded so to speak what we've changed um, and I'll go from there so our ongoing operations have changed um, a little bit and our revenue projections have changed a little bit since we started this budget process back in March with the advent of COVID um, the revenues that were most seriously impacted were those of meals lodging sales tax and recreational revenues our revenue numbers for March are now in. We saw a 28% decrease in meals tax, um, which we expected a 50% decrease. So there's a little piece of good news there. Um, and that's compared to March of last year. We saw a 38.44 decrease in revenue for lodging. Um, there again, we projected a 50% reduction for March. So a um, little piece of good news there. Um, sales tax were down about 4%, so not horrible. Um, most of the retail stayed somewhat solid throughout March, so we didn't see too big of a jump there. But all of the revenue, these revenues were all moving in an upward direction before COVID hit. So we were expecting to see some pretty nice increases. Um, Going to move my pictures here so I can actually read the slide. Um, the meals and lodging tax was trending at, even through March. We're up 1.4 percent for the same nine-month period as last year. Lodging tax was trending 10 percent upward, 
and sales tax was up 5%. So through the end of this year, we should fare fairly well, even with some of the nasty reductions that we've had due to COVID-19. Um, but I just wanted to give you that little piece of good news. Um, we are projecting 25% of our meals and lodging revenues for April, May, and June. Um, and same with meals, lodging, and um, sales tax. And we expect zero revenue from any of our recreational activities, both the Aquatic Center and Parks and Rec. Um, we do think we'll meet our projected numbers for the 2021 budget as they've been presented in the draft. Um, and of course, the future of where we're going depends on how quickly we get into economic recovery once things start opening up again. Um, we've maintained pretty strict control over spending for items that are just really needed to maintain operations um, and holding down expenditures. Um, doing that increases the amount of fund balance that will carry into the following year, which gives us a little bit more latitude with um, our expenditures into the following year gives us a little bit more of a cushion in our fund balance. Um, we're kind of keeping that thought going into 2021. We have left in there contracts for construction and, and grants and whatnot that are already committed contracts. We'd already entered into, the work was already in progress. We have left in the 2021 budget some capital items that we discussed last time that there's no time like the present to be able to do some of those projects. Um, so we're moving forward with that. Another piece of good news, we will be able to cover all of the costs that we have incurred so far uh, for PPE uh, through either FEMA or the CARES Act. Um, FEMA is gonna be last resort. If it's covered by CARES Act, then we won't claim it through FEMA. FEMA will only pay 75%, CARES Act will pay 100%. So um, we're kind of working out the details of the CARES Act now. Though that funding comes down to Montgomery County and then we're making it, Montgomery County will make a distribution to the two towns. And we've been working out how that distribution will be um, prorated out to each town and what will be covered by the county and that sort of thing. So we're kind of working that stuff out now because we'll be a pass through from the county. So what's still in the budget? There's no park, um, that's been totally removed and there are no fee increases of any kind and no water rate increase in this draft. Um, as for this year, we've reduced our revenue expectation for July, August and September to 25% of the prior years. We'll look at maybe 50% in October and then hopefully tapering off to at least the prior year's level in November. Um, but again, whatever COVID-19 brings us, we may have to adjust those expectations, um, hopefully, and we will pray for a speedy uh, economic recovery. Um, we have, with Parks and Rec, we have kept their revenues on the lower side as well, knowing that they're gonna have to do a lot of rescheduling and ramping up for new events for the new calendar year. Uh, we, move, we removed a lot of non-essential items from aquatics, some vehicles, leaf machines, and other capital items that, although we think we need them, they won't impair the provision of services in the near term. So we've left some of those items off for reconsideration later, depending on how the revenues do. Um, there are no new positions in this budget. Um, there's no proposed increases in our compensation plan, no, no real changes there. And the annual 2% merit allocation has been removed from this draft also. Although we really want to revisit that because we feel that the merit increases are extremely important to uh, our staff in terms of morale and all of those things. But again, that will depend on how things go with the recovery in COVID-19. We also removed the 1.85% multiplier for emergency services from this draft as well. Some of the capital items that we left in were the bathrooms at the rec center. If they're closed, best time to do it. Reduced operations, it's best time to do it. 
Same thing with some um, lightings at the aquatic center, um, doing some asphalt paving and also replacing the chiller and the condenser unit at the recreation center. They're pretty big projects, but there's no time like the present to get those done when things are at reduced, if not, if not closed, at least reduced operations. Um, some of the things that we took out to be looked at later, the aquatics LED sign, Betty Drive improvement, traffic signal, some pedestrian improvements on Franklin, uh, Cambria trail design, uh, pumps upgrades at Craig Mountain, uh, and a number of other items that if they come up that they have to be done faster than we're anticipating, then we'll bring that before council uh, to consider at a later time. Um, part of our meetings and work sessions were to discuss community support. These are the final numbers on community support. Um, 187, 273 is the final from our last discussion and last tally sheets. Um, we're gonna continue to put some funds into the assigned reserves and these are laid out here. They're also presented in the budget in several different places for you to review. This is just a quick look at the charts and graphs. These are contained within the budget, where the revenues come from and where the funds go. Um, just to get a good look for this upcoming year, it looks like most of our revenue is gonna be coming in from water and sewer. <laughs> and that's where most of our expenditures are, as well as public safety and public works. Um, our total assigned reserves after those new assignments will be $9.66 million. It's a net increase after additions of about $372,000, which is due in large part to the reduction of the reserves for the fire truck purchase the software and the expenditures of the park to date, which were about a million dollars. Um, the projected unassigned reserves will be 15.5 million, which is 42.26%, which is just above our adopted policy, which is a minimum of 30 and a, a high of 40. But I would suggest we just leave that for now. Um, it's a little bit above, but we don't really know what our expectations for COVID are. So um, it's a good position to be in at this point in time. Total budget is $49.7 million. That's a uh, $38 million in operating and $11.6 in capital. That's a $16 million decrease over last year's budget. So after this evening, our next steps will be to consider any comments from the public hearing, um, any comments from council, We'll make any adjustments to the budget as deemed appropriate. We'll take a quick look at some of our capital projects, make sure they're gonna finish up by year end. If not, what those rollovers are and make those adjustments as needed. And then at the next regular council session, we'll have a final vote on the budget uh, for approval, which will require several resolutions um, to set the tax rate one sets the approval of the budget and one sets the appropriation of the budget. So there'll be four different resolutions um, when we are ready to approve the budget. Any questions? I do. <laughs> um, we're to collect, we're still going to collect the 250 and then the 6,000 under the aquatic center, correct? Correct. Okay, so from where is the extra revenue gonna come in to cover all the uh, over $2 million of Christians for taxpayers going towards the Christians for the Aquatic Center? And when do you expect for the Aquatic Center to open back up? Uh, I'm not sure on the opening, I'll let Randy speak to that. The Aquatic Center has never been um, its revenues have never covered its expenses. It has always been supported by the general fund. Mm -hmm. in, in regards to the opening of the aquatic center right now, we can't basically because of governor's orders, he hasn't stated a, an opening date for indoor pools yet. So I can't necessarily answer that for you. 
Okay. Okay. And then uh, I guess this is still under the budget, but um, I have a question about the under the infrastructure and the budget. I know this was under the past budget agreement, but as we look forward to the new budget agreement for infrastructure and stormwater uh, of our town, I have some question. Uh, why was the market uh, place stormwater pond made a priority over the um, other stormwater projects in the town? And um, since the underwater shed started presentation from 2018, the marketplace was not even on the list. Randy, do you want to take that one? Oh, I will. Uh, the marketplace uh, agreement was basically incentive to re largely redo the intersection there. I don't think the main intent of that was for stormwater management, though that was part of the agreement. Uh, the large, largest part of that agreement was really geared towards relocation of the signal, uh, basically the signal going in at that location, relocation of entrance down to the mall so signal location on uh, North Franklin Street. So can you tell me a number that we pay to build a, a retaining pound of the marketplace, the, not to the, mention the provisions of the new entrance at all? The, the, um, total, I, the total agreement, I believe, was 1.38 million, but that was, again, most of that was really for a relocation of the, the entrance down to the, the signal. And no, how much was it? Those, those retention ponds were already there, weren't they? Yes, that's correct. The retention pond was already there and it w really was already serving as a regional pond. Uh, Randy, um, do you get a reply from Rector about the multifamily residential plans that were not a part of the original approved plans? Uh, and do have we have any idea or when he will be coming to council since he will need approval for the for that project to be done? Uh, I have a call on him, but I haven't spoken to him today. Uh, you know, he will have to come back to council. He is aware of that. His engineer is aware of that. So yes, the, the residential use will take conditional use permit approval, which will have to come to the planning commission and town council. Yeah, I have some questions about that. And when I say that, that, that means me. And then how is it that the newspapers and the TV news have more information, drawings and plans than me as a town council member or even the town manager? This is a multi-million dollar project. Uh, that we invest the tax paying money dollars in. Can you please answer me that question? Again, the residential use would take a conditional use permit. So, you know, he can't develop that without town council approval. It has to come to town council. Well, here is a drawing that he shows you right here where they're going to build 150 to 350 um, residential properties right there at the marketplace. Uh -huh. Not, not without town council approval. Well, he went to the news and everything, and he told everybody that. Um. Six, I do believe that the marketplace does have a PR firm in Blacksburg as well. So some things may be um, out of control. Can we, can, we please, can we please stick to the budget? We've kind of gone off on a tangent now. Well, this is part of the infrastructure too, and part of the budget because we're counting on money from property. No, you, from you're, talking property about, some, you're talking about you're talking about what a uh, PR person put out for the marketplace, which then any type of rezoning would need to come back through council. That's where you've taken us. Can we stick to the budget items? So that's really a dead issue until he comes back. He can brag Correct. about it all he wants, but it ain't happening until planning and we approve. So do you guys have any knowledge about this? I did not. Randy? I believe that's kind of been a secondary plan for him. If it didn't fully develop as commercial, that he may build, build residential. But again, it does take town council approval. But we weren't aware he was making that announcement, I don't think. No, no I wasn't aware he was making any announcement. Again, it does take town council approval. And in regards to the budget, I don't think the budget really contemplates revenue from the marketplace because it's not even really developed yet. Uh, you know, I don't think our revenue projections are, are really based on revenue from the marketplace per se. Well, isn't it part of the budget if we're moving stores from the mall are coming to this marketplace now and we got different stores from different places in the town moving into this new development. 
So it is part of the Baja, wouldn't it? We Again, have, I don't think we really contemplated additional revenue from the marketplace being developed in, in this draft budget. No, we did not. Okay. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Let's move on to the uh, lease agreement for Fiber Technologies, LLC. Uh, I would Kendrick like to make Parker. a comment. Can I, can I make a comment? Well, yeah. I, I just wanted to make a, a, a bow when you were reading that off. I was really impressed with um, the meals tax, how between July and March, we are up uh, almost a, a percent and a half. And I was really surprised to see that and, and happy. And I was even, even more surprised when I saw the July to March uh, thing for lodging. Is, was April, is April going to be our worst month, do you think? I would venture yes, it will be since um, a lot, I, I know like, for example, up here, Ruby Tuesdays was open the first couple weeks in April, but then they shut down entirely and they haven't reopened um, for even takeout. I think they just found it wasn't profitable enough. and. Some of the restaurants that do alcoholic beverage just weren't finding it profitable um, to continue with the to-go. Now, Charlie's is doing fine with it. A couple other restaurants are. Um, most of them are saying they're just kind of breaking even if, and it keeps some of their employees working. But I think April will be our worst month because a lot of them just totally shut down um, and had absolutely no revenue. Some of them started opening back up again in May or at least doing more carryout service. So I think April will be our worst month. You know, I was uh, looking what Golden Corral and IHOP, and I think there's one other restaurant. Is, is that the only restaurant that you know of that, that have closed? Crab Creek. That's the little uh, seafood place. They're only open on the weekends. Um, it's over behind El Bronco. Yeah, I know where it is. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Other one I'm aware of. Hearing no other questions, we will move on to the next item, which is the lease agreement with Fiber Technology Solutions, LLC. Randy, uh, I think we've talked about this before. Uh, you want to give us a synopsis on it? I know the lease pack, the lease was in the packet uh, yes. to look at. It was about three quarters of the packet from what I understand. Yes, this is basically an agreement for the former row furniture Mayflower moving building. Uh, it does require a public hearing for the lease agreement. That's basically what we're doing. Uh, council tentatively already agreed on the agreement. Uh, we would get $2,500 a month uh, rent for the building. It's one year guaranteed, and then it would go to a monthly lease after that. They plan on using the left-hand bay of the building and also the office area. And in, in exchange for the office area, they'd pay for the electric on the building, which runs about five to 6,000 a year additionally. So we'd receive uh, 30,000 a year. And then, like I say, they'd pay the electric on the building for basically use of that uh, large 10,000 square foot area, left-hand bay of the building. And this is a contractor for Comcast, uh, basically fiber installation company. I think that's great. Uh, and just I'll mention, if you'd like to take action on this under action at, uh, by council, you can. I would like to second that if for whoever wants to make a motion to approve this. Well, uh, do I have a motion to move it uh, for discussion to uh, actions by mayor and council? Well, Joanna, Joanna has the first, I'll do the second. Okay. okay. So we will move that in, okay. And that's the only thing we have at this point. Okay, uh, anything else in the public hearing side of it? To none. We have the consent agenda, which is approval of the minutes of May 12th, the monthly bill list, approval of a change order number four, totaling $113,766 for Huckleberry Tra Trail phase three project, we need to schedule the following public hearings. On June 23rd, a rezoning request by Magnolia Point Community LLC 
for property owners by International Church of Four Square Gospel, a California corporation. The request is to rezone the property of 9.14 acres of property from A Agriculture to R3 multifamily residential with proffers. The property is designated as residual in the future land use map of the 2013 comprehensive plan. Conditional use permit request continuing on proceeding by Magnolia Point uh, for planned housing development consists of multifamily dwellings and townhouses at a density of development at 16 units per acre on property located uh, northeast intersection of Peppers Ferry Road and a street vacation request by Gay and Neal for the ordinance to vacate approximately 0.12 acre portion of right of way along the east side of North Franklin Street located adjacent to the intersection of North Franklin and Acre Farm Road. The portion of that right of way uh, adjoins 100 acres Farm Road. These are all for the 23rd for the July 14th, a rezoning request by Montgomery County School Board for the property located at 28 College Street. Uh, the request is to rezone the property from R2 to family residential to B3 general business. This property is designated downtown mixed use on the future land map use of the comprehensive plan. A conditional use permit contingent on the preceding items. The request is for a commercial garage, maintenance shop, and contractor storage yard in the B3 general business district. We have a rezoning request from Golden Triangle LLC for a two acre property tax map property tax map 53-2-87C located north, north of Glade Drive and South of Interstate 81. The request is to rezone the property from A Agriculture to R3 Multifamily Residential. The property is designated as residential on the future land use map 2013 comprehensive plan. And the conditional use request contingent upon the preceding request to amend the approved plan housing Reagan's Point subdivision. Uh, the request is to modify the approved development plan in order to allow nine additional single family dwellings to be constructed within the development, a portion of which will be located on uh, tax parcel 530-2-87C uh, in the R3 multifamily residential district. So those are your consent items. Do I have a motion to approve? I'll make a, yeah, I'll make a motion. We approve the consent agenda as, as presented. I'll second. second. Several seconds. Michelle, pick your take on that one. Uh, any, any comments? Then Mrs. Stipes, I'll ask you to poll the council. Yes. Can I hear you? Councilman Bishop? Aye. Councilwoman Hicks? Aye. Councilman Huppert? Aye. Councilwoman Sachs? Aye. Councilman Showalter? Aye. Councilman Stipes? Aye. That is 6 -0. Thank you very much. Uh, we have no introductions and presentations scheduled for tonight. Uh, under citizens' comments, we did have two comments from citizens that were received by six o'clock tonight. Uh, both of them are from residents on eight, uh, on College Street, uh, Mr. Brian Hendricks, 840 College Street, and Barbara Haley, 962 College Street. And they all were in concern with the flooding. Uh, Mr. H Mr. Hendricks had given the damage flooding this weekend along College Street and other locations. What is going to be done to address the stormwater issues in that area? While the ground was already saturated and the storm was quick and intense, this is not a one-time experience and needs to be addressed. I've lived College Street for eight years. I have seen similar events several times throughout the years. Why is the drainage from Main Street being released through people's yards, including mine, and where it funnels downhill and meets up with the already overflowing College, draining, College Street drainage to flood our yards, basements and houses? Right, The system is in place, can't handle all what is being fed to it with disastrous uh, consequences. And the second was from Barbara Haley at 962 College Street. I would like to know what is going to be done regarding the flood problem every time it rains. The evergreens that border 960 College Street and 962 College Street are dead. 
it would be interesting I would be interested to know, in knowing what is coming for that storm drain on Main Street. My, my neighbors all have water in the basement from all of the fancy, all of the fancy last week. Now that's the way it was worded, I'm not sure. And from Sunday's storm. There's also standing water in the downstairs of my son's house. I've called the Public Works Department regarding the standing water, but nothing gets done about it. I have reached out to, on Ms. Haley's comment, uh, I got her cell phone number and I reached out to Chief Hanks with the fire department and he is going to have someone reach out to her uh, to address her son's water issues. And Randy, what do you got on the rest of it? You're muted, Randy. I'm gonna share a spreadsheet that I have. Hang on just a second. Just to give you an idea of some stormwater projects that we've done in the past, and uh, some of these certainly benefit this area. Uh, we've done culvert replacement near South Franklin Street. Uh, that was 2017. Of course, these are broken down by, you can see each, each year, the spending that we've done in 17, 18, and 19, and also the current fiscal year. Uh, as I mentioned, the culvert replacement near South Franklin, we did the Brown Church and Lucas storm drain improvement project the Church Rigby Ellet Storm Drain Improvement Project. Uh, we've done Hans Meadow Drainage Phase Two over the last several years. We've done a couple of Blue Leaf Stream Restoration Projects, the Town Branch Stream Restoration Project, the North Franklin Street Drainage Improvements, uh, Industrial Park Stormwater Management Area Improvements. Uh, we've completed the Downtown Watershed Study, where I guess still, still in progress, Hickok Street Improvements Phase One, and some things uh, downtown, I guess, benefit projects, the North Frank Franklin Street drainage improvements, Hickok Street drainage improvements, Stone Street culvert uh, replacement at Town Branch, College Street drainage improvements, phase one's a future project uh, that's estimated to be a $4.25 million project. Uh, Christman Mill and Fleeker Street drainage improvements, for our future projects, Allegheny Street, Canaan, and Epperly Drive drainage improvements, College Street drainage improvements, Roanoke Street drainage improvements, and Radford Street drainage improvements. Vinny Drive uh, restoration, stream restoration project, and also Town Branch stream restoration. And I'm gonna bring up a map here. And this gives you an idea of the drainage basin downtown and the College Street area. Uh, College Street, if you can see my cursor, is really right down this area. And basically this channel flows into the Hickok Street area and then on down towards Depot Street. So a lot of these projects interrelate to each other. Uh, just an example, the Hickok Street project that we've got planned uh, next fiscal year would improve uh, basically the, the College Street area drains to that drainage system, which then leads into piping that goes down to Depot Street. So again, you know, a lot of these projects, and you can see all the dots on the, the projects that we've got in the area. We, each red dot's a particular project that we've got called out on this map. Just kind of gives you an idea of some of the things we've got planned in the area and have done in the area. 
Uh, of course, obviously these are expensive projects. They, they run into the millions of dollars. That's part of the reason we have the stormwater fee. Uh, you know, I am, you know, I guess sorry for the, the incidences that happened. We definitely had a lot of property damage in the area. Again, hopefully that, you know, some of these projects will alleviate that in the future. But, uh, you know, basically we're just trying to do what we can as we can, but it does take funding. And again, it takes, uh, you know, a lot of work to do these projects. We'd have to do easement acquisition through that area if we were gonna do any type of type of project in the area. And again, you know, without, and we do a set, seek grant funding. Uh, typically, if we do like say, for example, a revenue sharing project, that's what the Hickok Street project's proposed to be. That's 50-50 funding. And that, that's actually VDOT funding source. So uh, we do seek grant funding for anything that we can and obviously try to leverage our own town resources as best we can. Well, we're gonna move that College Street thing up the priority list a little ways, at least to get it in the, in the radar of the grant funding. I think, I think we can have that discussion uh, with, with budget. Uh, you know, right now it's, it's not scheduled with the budget, but we are looking at adding new projects in potentially in the fall, assuming that, that we are past the COVID-19 effects on the budget that's you know not guaranteed but you know as we had mentioned we are looking at potentially budget revisions in the fall and i think we certainly consider those type of revisions randy if we pick on uh, the cheaper option for the drainage system for hickok street instead of doing the one on hickok street um we can probably do another project somewhere else in the town is that correct I, I think that may be a possibility, although one thing I'll caution you is that these pipes lead to each other. So if you are fixing the upstream pipes, basically making those a higher capacity without fixing the downstream pipes first, you may basically be pushing the problem further down the, the drainage way. And so basically you could just be pushing the problem further down. Typically you start at the more more the outlet of these type projects and kind of work your way back rather than the other way around. And that's what we are basically trying to do with, with Hickok Street project. That's the reason it's scheduled ahead, ahead of the College Street project. But it seems as the water was happening and we had all this flooding going on this week, it didn't seem like Hickok was an issue. Every Everywhere else around town, we had many water issues, but as far as Hickok Street, I don't see Hickok Street flooding at all. There is not even a creek on, on the top of Hickok Street right now. Sure there is. There's two of them. I thought that one was going underneath other people's buildings right now. And there's one under the church, I think, the church parking lot, Presbyterian Church parking lot, if I'm not mistaken. It, it there is a pipe there and it is under the pipe under the Alcorn building also, so, the channel. Well, I think that the fact that this thing, these things are, are, have been fairly devastating. And, you know, I read the newspaper articles today and some of the people affected blamed uh, some of our town uh, stormwater pond projects. And Randy and I discussed this. I'm not aware that we have any stormwater pond projects up that way. The only one there is at the middle school and that's the county's property. Is that correct? I believe that's the only pond that that is government owned in the area. I, I, you know, don't quote me that for, with that without checking with engineering, but I believe that's the case. Um, you know, there has there has been a fair amount of development. You know, the morning mist development. Uh, you know, the middle school was obviously developed. Uh, you know, we've got development at Kensington, and also uh, you know, Melinda's Melody development. Although all of those have to meet state erosion and sediment control and stormwater management regulations. And, you know, if we want to go beyond state regulations, that's acceptable, but just, you know, just be aware, take, be a council decision if you want to require anything additional above state requirements. Randy, I have a question about the catch pond. Do, okay. we not have, do we not have a catch pond at the townhomes off Rafford Road that runs there, down to a hillcrest. There, there is a small pond on the other side of Depot Street, uh, across College from College Street. The retention money. You talking about the apartments on Radford Street, right there? Uh, you go up, up on the hill. 
up on the hill because I was up there the other day looking and I thought there was an area that's fenced off. That's the, it, I think the developer had to put that in, Sam. I'm not, I don't think we did. I, I don't know. Is okay. that with the, the, the duplex that's there? No, it's the apartments. No. There's the, I can't remember the Ridgeview, not Ridgeview, but anyway, they're off near uh, uh, behind. Yeah. Close to the cemetery. Across from the, the Schaefer Cemetery. But there is a retention pond there, but I do believe that was when it was built. The developer had to put that in. Okay, because apparently when that pond overflows, it runs down to Hillcrest that's causing problems. Okay. I'll have engineering take a look, look at it. All right, thank you. Okay. Okay, anything else? And I'll just mention that I have the Chiefs, uh, or Chief Sisson and Chief Cole on the line, if you, uh, you'd like to hear an update from them. We'll do that in staff reports, Randy. We're still okay. a couple of places off from it. Uh, under committee reports, I don't think we've had any committee meetings. Is that correct, ladies and gentlemen? That's correct. Okay. Uh, discussion and action by mayor and council. Uh, we have had a motion to move the lease agreement to this section. Do I have a motion? Uh, any comments or questions? Madam Clerk? Yes, sir. Councilman Bishop? Uh, Councilwoman Hicks? Aye. Councilman Huppert? Aye. Councilwoman Sachs? Aye. Councilman Showalter? Aye. Councilman Stipes? Aye. That's six, sir. Thank you very much. On staff reports from the town manager, you got anything else to add other than what we've done so far? No. <laughs> <laughs> Had pretty busy night though. Uh, Reed, you got anything for, as the attorney? I have nothing to add, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chief uh, Sisson and Chief Cole, if you would like to update us on things with the COVID situation. Hey, Mayor, this is Val. After the Chiefs, I do have a question for Council. Okay. Thank you. Chief Sisson. Mr. Mayor, members of Council, good to see each of you. I hope you're doing well. Just want to give a quick update on the Montgomery Regional Health Task Force as we continue uh, to push hard in the region. Just give you a testing update. To date, we've done 2,500 uh, COVID-19 tests in our region, which is just a phenomenal number for this area. Positive cases, 69 in Montgomery County, five in Floyd, 12 in Pulaski, five in Giles. Of those positive cases, we've had 12 hospitalizations and unfortunately one death. The positive uh, to our testing in the region is that we are at 3.9% positive rate, which is much lower than the state average. State average is 14.1%. So that, that tells us we're doing the right things in this region follow, following CDC guide, guidelines and uh, just being good citizens. And um, so we should, should applaud our citizens for that and continuing to progress and uh, we'll keep testing. Uh, we tested today in Pulaski, and we'll be in Floyd on Thursday. Uh, we did have Senator Kane on our call this morning, and just to talk a little bit, I think Valerie mentioned the CARES Act. So obviously, municipalities and cities were, were excited about the money coming down because we need it regionally. But the one thing that we spoke with Senator Kane about, that money is very narrow. Uh, it's, it's come down to the municipalities to the counties initially with some very strict guidelines that that money can be used for COVID-19 related operations. And uh, we appreciate that, but I think we're around $8.1 million that's come down to the county or will be coming down. We talked to Senator Kane about, you know, the broad economic issues that we're having from a municipal city and even a county standpoint 
and we talked to him about some flexibility in the, using that money um, to help us recover economically as a community. So he was interested in that conversation. So hopefully we'll see some discussion above us uh, in the weeks to come to kind of broaden those guidelines in the near future where we have an opportunity to, to use CARES money to try to help our community get back on its feet, in, including our municipality. So as far as the task force and our, and our update, things are going well. Uh, we appreciate the support from council and we'll can continue to work hard every day uh, to, to a day that we can say we're recovered. Thank you. Chief Coley online. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, was there a question for Mark? I do, I have a quick question. Mark, thank you so much for everything that you're doing during this time. I wanna uh, extend my thank you. Uh, efforts to everybody in your department as well as the fire department um, and the rescue squad and everybody else involved with uh, helping our community. But out of those testing, you said that there is 69 right now. Is there a way that you can kind of um, separate the amount of uh, cases that you actually have from Christians for citizens? Or is that something that you guys are not keeping track of? as far as people that live in the town that were um, passed, that came back positive with the, with the COVID-19. We could possibly ask the health department to separate those numbers. Now they're being divided in by zip code through VDA. Uh, the problem with the zip code is, you know, folks that live in the county still have a 24073 area code or zip code. So I can follow up with the health department director to see if she has <sighs> specific breakdown of those numbers uh, for, for Christiansburg, Blacksburg, Montgomery County separately. But at this time, I don't think that she does. I don't think they're not going to calculate those numbers by jurisdiction lines. Will that help make a difference in case of us reopening some of the businesses in the town? Let's per se, we only had uh, 20 cases or 10 cases or five cases in the town of Christiansburg that were positive for the coronavirus um, and as for say this happened a month ago or two weeks ago and now those people are probably back in uh, in our community do you think that there is a way that maybe we can uh, easy things for easy make things easier for businesses to reopen because of the small amount of cases that we may have if that was a case yeah and the problem with that is I don't I don't think we have authority to do that regionally I mean, we're under uh, governor order at this time, and we're going to have to follow the guidelines that are sent from the governor's office. And, you know, we're in phase one right now. We're hoping to move into phase two as we get into late this week, hopefully next week. But a lot of that is up in the air, depending on, on the governor's uh, stance at the end of this week. And now, as far as the mask usage, um, is there anything that you have to make sure that you enforce it or can we just let it go for um from business to business how does that work as far as what were you told today as far as that goes well in today today's governor's briefing uh, he did say that there was an expectation for virginia citizens to mask um, when they're inside buildings when they're in brick and mortar businesses and barbershops salons uh, but he was very specific to say that that would not be enforced by law enforcement across the Commonwealth. He puts the enforcement arm of his order today, which will be effective on Friday of uh, citizen masking. Um, he puts that enforcement arm upon BDA. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion that needs to be had on the, on the Virginia Department of Health side because, you know, that's a tough task for them to manage masking in our community because they're very busy with community testing and some other things so our health departments have a lot of work in front of them i appreciate that thank you mark you know I, i've been impressed i check the paper every day and montgomery county was at 66 for i bet close to 10 days and then it went up to 69 but it seems like that we have uh, really come to a plateau, if maybe more than that, to uh, slow down the, uh, the, the cases in, in this area. Do you feel that way, uh, Mark? Well, I mean, I think your statistical numbers over the past 14 days have, have plateaued. 
you know, we, we just hope and pray that we continue to uh, decrease in numbers and that we get back to some normalcy in our com community. Yeah, I think that 69 figure is cumulative from day one. I mean, we already know that, that unfortunately one gentleman died. That puts us at 68 cases. And I think, you know, over the eight weeks, there's had, I sure, I'm sure that once they were diagnosed, there was a testing recall from the health department on some of these people. And if they were given a clean bill of health, they don't seem to want to reduce the number of cases out there. That's an accurate statement. That's a total number of positive cases in Montgomery County, which would be 69. And we would assume at this point, if they're not hospitalized, they're recovered. And there are 14 hospitalizations that you know of? Well, there's been 12 to date, and that's in Montgomery, Floyd, Pulaski, and Giles. Okay. All right. Very good. I think, I think I saw it last week there was either nobody or maybe one hospitalization. So, so most of those have recovered. Okay. But they don't adjust the figure, so it's kind of hard to, it's kind of scary to think. I did see one location this week that did reduce their number by one. Why they did it, it could have been a death, I don't know. So, okay. Uh, Anything, I, any I other got a question? question, Mike. Yes, sir. I just want to make sure I heard Mark correct um, that the health department is going to enforce the mask mandate, not law enforcement. That's correct. That was in the governor's briefing today. Uh, he gave very um, narrow instructions to the Virginia Department of Health, but he was very explicit that it would not be enforced by law enforcement across the Commonwealth. Okay. Hmm. Thanks. Yes, uh, did he say today that he's going to make another statement on Thursday about the possibly opening other areas? If, if so, I missed that. I know that he has another briefing scheduled on Friday. Okay. Mark, if you, this is Henry, if, if you if you hear anything else different about the enforcement, could you reach out to us? Yes, sir, I can. Thank you. Very good. Uh, is Chief Coyle on the line? Yes, sir, I'm here. Joe, what do you got for us? Yeah, so I mean, from the EMS operations perspective, we're we're kind of holding steady. Our our call volume uh, still hovers around a 12% decrease over. Uh, year to date last year, and that's that's where it's been holding since uh, about March, and we expect that to last for a while, and then we'll start seeing it go back up as as people regain confidence in going back into the ER, and that's really the message uh, that we're unified with on the health department. If you are sick, you need to go to the ER. That's really important. We don't want you waiting until you're getting really, really, really sick. If you're sick and need to go to the ER, you, sh you should go to the ER, but our call volume is down about 12 percent, and from a personal protective equipment standpoint, we're doing fine. Uh, and we're just kind of holding steady right now. No real issues. Joe, I, I understand and I saw this morning that you all had been awarded the, for the fourth straight year, the American Heart Association Award. Would you brief counsel on that a little bit? Congratulations, incidentally. Sure, thank you. Yeah, so um, that, that program um, we implemented about five years ago. Uh, in the first year, we won the Silver Award. And then for the four years following that, we won the, the Gold Plus Award. And that's an award that recognizes how well and how efficiently we get someone who's having a heart attack into definitive treatment, which is a cath lab. And so uh, there's a lot of different measures, the scene time, how quickly we obtain a 12 lead EKG, how quickly we let the receiving facility know that uh, we have the heart attack, and then the ultimate time from when we first contacted the patient to when they're actually getting the stent placed in the artery that's clogged in their heart. All of those things require a system, and so we're a big part of that system, and, and we have a lot of uh, stringent criteria we have to meet to get that award. So we're really proud of that award. And again, it's the, the fourth year for gold and the fifth year overall of winning the award. Thank you. Congratulations again. Thank you. Any questions for Chief Coyle? Uh, I do, and, and just to make certain that we are going to, and this really can ex expand to Mark and uh, Chief Hanks as well, but Joe, we do plan to use the uh, uh, the CARES Act uh, money to replenish our stock of PPE and even maybe stock up for future as well. Um, that would be a portion of the use, I would think. That, that's a Randy and Val question as well, but um, the, the CARES Act funding that Rescue got is specifically 
uh, we have to use it to offset any funding losses that we had. So I think PPE would certainly be um, a use for that. And we're at our new normal for PPE. Going forward, um, all of our providers are gonna have to be fit tested and wear N95s. This was something that EMS stopped doing several years ago nationwide. Uh, the CDC and OSHA said we didn't have to. And we realized the new normal is now we're gonna have to have a respiratory fit program and every provider that's on our ambulances is gonna to have to be wearing that, that extra level of PPE or the ability to. We are going to seek reimbursement for any PPE we buy in response to COVID-19 through the CARES Act. Uh, we plan on seeking that through part of the county money that, that basically we're negotiating with them. Thanks. Sure. Any questions for the chiefs? Thank you. Well, I think you had a question, I'm sorry. Thank you, Joe. And uh, is Mr. Hanks coming in too? He's not. He's not available tonight. He has another meeting. Well, he'll probably watch the the video anyway. But um, first of all, I wanted to thank Valerie before because she did a good job with our budget. Um, Mar Susan, um, thank you so much for continuing to do the work you're doing, and all the uh, other guys in there. And also uh, the fire department, I want to thank you so much for helping uh, the families that were affected this week with the flooding issues that we had. Um, it's unfortunate that a lot of people have lost a lot of their belongings. Um, some people have lost um, lots of stuff in their homes and, and um, unfortunately a family have lost their dog. So I, I really want to extend my condolences to this couple that have lost their dog. And um, hopefully our town can help them with some of the infrastructure that can um, hopefully prevent this from happening in the future. So is there anything that we can plan from now um, until something can actually get done more permanent to make sure that this does not happen within the next, you know? hopefully next months or so. We're supposed to get more water <laughs> coming in this week and and I hope it doesn't rain so much, but um, it's something that concerns a lot of people. You know, we could have lost a life underneath one of those basements. It could have been a person underneath there. So we, we definitely had to make sure that we do provide some, some help to these families and, um, and to all the people that, you know, that lost any belongings or that their properties got destroyed this week because of the floods that we got this week. I'm so sorry and um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Val, did you have a question for us? Uh, yes. Uh, I just wanted to remind you that the resolution that we passed for water turnoff was to extend it for 90 days from the date of uh, the original due date. So the first bill that this applied to was the bill that was due on March the 1st, which means it, late in the month of June, we would start water cutoff for those people who have not paid their March bill. And to have their water turned back on, they'd have to um, pay all past due accounts and or enter into a payment agreement with us. Um, currently we have about, best we can tell, we're having trouble getting the information out of uh, GP and we're still working on that. But there's about 875 people who have um, not paid one or more bills. Um, so that's kind of where we stand. And I just wanted to make sure that you are aware of that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. No, is there any other staff, Andrew, any of you on, on board that you want to say anything? Hey, Mike. Yeah. I, have a, I have a question for Val, please. Okay. Val, are we sending any kind of notification to remind people to pay these water bills if possible? There is a note on every water bill that we sent out to remind them to um, Please try and keep your bills current. Please try and make some payments. Don't let yourself get too far behind. That's been on every bill we've sent out. Um, we're trying to, the list we're trying to pull right now is a list that would give us the past dues by month and their addresses and names so that we can send out another reminder letter to say okay. before June gets here, 
please get in touch with us. Please set up a payment plan. Don't wait to the day of cutoff um, to take care of this. So we're working on putting that list together right now. We're just really struggling with getting the information matched up and pulled up out of the system. We can pull it person by person, um, but we can't, we're having trouble getting who didn't pay in March with a name and address, not just an account number, um, because that would force us to have to go in and look up every account number and pull up the address and all that. So we're trying to get that pulled out in one list. Um, hopefully tomorrow, she told me, hopefully Friday, but I don't have it yet. So we're still working on it. But we will okay. do that. We'll try and get a letter out. All right. Thank you, Bio. Uh-huh. Thank you. All right. Uh, council reports. Mr. Stipes. Okay. I've been sort of quiet this evening. I'll say a couple things here. I want to start by expressing uh, our uh, sympathy for the people that are suffering with the, uh, with the flooding of the last several days. Uh, uh, was at a couple different locations over the weekend uh, looking at these people that have you know been letting us know and we're certainly I just want to reassure everybody first of all that we do care and the town has been prioritizing Randy thank you for putting presenting us with that information uh, about our master stormwater plan and the projects and I want to most of all express our sympathy and our support for our citizens that are dealing with flooding issues. Uh, and the, the comments that have been made, uh, there are three different aspects. There's hydrology, which is runoff characteristics, which is the cause of these problems to begin with is as our stormwater or as our uh, town develops, the runoff has increased over years from years and decades ago. Then you have hydraulics, which is stormwater collection and conveyance, which is another issue and then you have stormwater management which is actually detaining stormwater all three of these are related i don't want to get into a expose here but i want to assure our citizens that we are on this and have a plan for addressing these things and i do think it's something we need to revisit from time to time uh, but to solve the issues at a couple of locations one of them being college which is very poignant uh, people that you know i know personally have been affected by this in other places, but uh, that has to be looked at on the macroscope. You met, uh, a mention was made of Hickok Street. That's a lower reach of this and not necessarily fixing one area fixes the problem at that location because to use a metaphor, if you have a, if you fix a, a large pipe in one place and you have a sippy straw downstream, uh, it's not gonna work. The whole system has to be uh, looked at and I just want to assure people that it's on our minds it's, it's in our budget it's we're seeking funding for this and we do need to revisit this from time to time and I certainly do think we need to uh, Randy look at that as a council as soon as we can you know get together just revisit that plan again and, and see some of these hot spots uh, but what I will note uh, is that there are other areas that have already been solved and alleviated uh, that we would you know would also have have had problems so far so uh, that doesn't help the people that are dealing with the property loss and damage right now but we do care and we are on it and we're doing what we can do i just want to assure people of that second of all um, i want to uh, uh, applaud a nice note from uh, uh, councilman hubbard in the paper i don't always agree with what he puts out there but i really did this time <laughs> And Councilman Huppert put out, when I say I don't agree with it, it may not, we don't share the same views on some things, but I really, I really applaud the note uh, to provide safe, the need for safe outdoor spaces uh, in our community is a need, it's not a want. And uh, we, we've seen that in our community out on the Huckleberry Trail. And um, we've done some, and just reminding people that we have a plan for a big open space here uh, that we, we do need to do. We've done other big projects with some resistance. The recreation center was one. I remember I was here. I just moved back when I heard that. Not everyone was in favor of that, but uh, the Hark Raider, uh, the Huckleberry Trail extension, not everyone was in favor of that to start with. Uh, Aquatic center, same thing. And so I, will, I just want to note that uh, this current crisis has made us look at the importance of safe outdoor spaces 
uh, not just for health, but for, um, for safety and mental health. And Steve, thank you for putting that out there. That's it. Thank you, Brady. Uh, Councilman Showalter. Thanks, Mike. And I concur with uh, Brad. Uh, my heart goes out to the families uh, up on College Street. That's, that's something awful. But I mean, this is something the town has um, the slated uh, flagger in years past uh, sitting on a committee. I would any, any type of major event like this, we would hear, hear about. So really, I'm looking um, uh, forward to getting staff feedback at the end of the first quarter to see if we can't uh, expedite um, one or two of those projects. And I would like to challenge staff to come back to council at our next meeting to see if there's any temporary measures we can, we can help the people on uh, College Street um, for uh, a future event like this, so which, which could happen. Also, Flager. I know Flager is also in there as well. And those are our top uh, stormwater projects that are on the list. So, um, but um, in regards to Steve Hubbard, Steve, that was a, a good editorial. I'm glad you mentioned, a, or, or you, you pulled in the current event, uh, the COVID-19 event, because the Huckleberry is probably one of the major attractions right now for recreation. Uh, I'll walk it and it's almost like a highway out there at this point. And I'm glad you incorporated that into your editorial with the need for more recreation space. Other than that, I do appreciate everything our first responders are doing. Um, it, it's nothing new. Uh, fire rescue and the, and the police, they're constantly, uh, you know, helping citizens, being there for citizens uh, during these events, COVID-19, now the flooding. And it just, uh, it's, it's great that we have these great individuals and these great leaders. Uh, within our town government. That's it for me. Thanks. Very good. Uh, Councilman Bishop. I'm sorry, Councilman Huppert. Okay. <laughs> Councilman Huppert. Well, I would like to thank both of you for your fine comments. Uh, and I would like to say something that we, we talk about all the time, really, but I just want to review it for a second uh, about how local companies are hurting that are still closed down and uh, an example of that um terry stike who is the owner of the um, uh, nrv bowling alley and uh, adventure world he called me this afternoon and told me how he has been shut down you know for months now revenue there's no revenue going but he's still paying his mortgages and just to remind, and of course these different restaurants are the same thing, just to remind people, you know, that when this thing is over, you know, to support these places and go out of the way. Maybe you haven't been bowling in 15 years, but maybe it might be good to, you know, just for your health and just for the health of the community. And so I'm, I'm just hoping that we can all stay together on this and work together. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Mr. Bishop. Yes, first of all, I would like to say I agree with what Officer uh, Councilman Stipes and Showalter has said. I myself ran out to college when they had the flooding, also Hillcrest, and yeah, I hope the town can do something real soon. And once again, I want to salute our first responders because they do stuff that we usually don't see. So once again, I salute y'all for what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sachs. Uh, thank you so much. I agree with what has been said before me, so I won't repeat it. Um, but good job, Steve, on the editorial. And also, I wanted to mention that we did lose an icon um, that the owner of Country um, Kitchen on Radford Road, um, I believe they called her Miss Stott, she passed away. And uh, just acknowledging what she gave to our community, she really served us well. Um, and also a shout out to Simon Rama to say thanks um, for working with the school board system. Quick turnaround on all of the signs that are up by the high school. So thanks to a local small business. And everyone stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hicks. Um, about the, um, the parks, is unfortunately we cannot use the many parks we have in the town of Christiansburg. 
right now, the aquatic center, um, we got over nine parks here in the town of Christiansburg that we cannot use right now. The Truman Wilson property, as far as Mr. Hopper goes, I'm not against the park, but I do uh, not agree with us spending money on the marketplace for the stormwater ponds and everything. So we could have the income from the marketplace to pay for that. I don't think people appreciate right now that their houses are being flooded and everything. So as far as the article goes, it's great to have parks and everything, but I think we can cut down on the park as far as for the future, not make it so expensive and make it um, more economic where we town or Christians for citizens can pay for it. That would be the right way to go as far as that goes. Or, um, But I really encourage people as well to go and make sure that if he's, um, there is, I know uh, we are going to be, uh, the College Street property, um, as far as the school board, it was requesting the county, the school board from the county were asking for a conditional use permit for the 208 College Street. I, I will encourage people to, to, to make any public comments about this. If, if this is important to you, I see that uh, they're requesting for us to give them, uh, to change the zoning plans. So in the downtown area, we can have for the middle school where the old middle school was supposed to be, so we can have a storage units and uh, garage units and a parking uh, place for for the buses. That to me worries me. I I would like to see um, something developed there. Um, maybe uh, business incubators like Blacksburg did, or maybe have apartments down there. Have more businesses down there instead of having a bus parking lot for all the buses. So that I, I hope that people can 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 speak about that if that's something that is an importance to you. I do hope that our town public works or uh, some of our people that work for the town can can do something to help and alleviate some of the, the problems with the flooding issues that we're having right now. Maybe we can do a temporarily fix right now and then hopefully um, try to get some more money from all these other grants and hopefully from the money that we are paying for storm water fees. Um, thank you to everybody that's doing such a good job. Uh, as far as Valerie, you're doing a really good job with the budget and everything else. And then Hanks and everybody else and the rescue squad department and um, thank you to the community for um, the ones that are staying home and, and everything. So be safe. And if you can, wear your mask inside places. And then thank you so much. Thank you. I have nothing other than to echo all the thoughts about the victims of the flooding and our first responders. Uh, I had on my agenda to mention to congratulate the rescue squad, but since we had Joe, I thought I'd let him explain that. Is there any other business to come before council? If not, we are adjourned. Thank you.